Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andriy Shevchenko. On behalf of the team of Media Center of Ukraine, I welcome all the journalists telling the word about our struggle for freedom. We will be talking with Oleksandra Romansova, who is the executive director of the Center for Civil Liberties. Oleksandra is part of the um, an initiative group united under the name uh, under the title tribunal for Put for putin the idea behind the initiative is obvious to find a way to see that uh, putin faces uh, international justice putin and the people from his vertical uh, that have to do with the aggression and further crimes in the ukraine Panyo Alexandro, uh, hello and could you tell us about your initiative slavo ukraini hello everyone our initiative, uh, Tribunal for Putin, was uh, formed by three largest advocacy groups that deal with documenting war crimes primarily. This is the Center for Civil uh, Liberties, the Kharkiv uh, Advocacy Group, and the Ukrainian Helsinki uh, Group. We are, we're later joined by other organizations where we now number 29 different organizations. These are advocates uh, from all over Ukraine, from every region. We document war crimes. Uh, most of us have been documenting war crimes since 2014, so we have a lot of experience. We started uh, way back when no one was doing this, and we're currently working with the attorney's office. Uh, some of our organizations even train the attorney's office because this is a particular process. International crimes uh, that Russia is perpetrating in the territory of Ukraine starting has been perpetrating since 2014, both war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes of genocide and the crime of uh, aggression, the start of war um, invasion. The, our job is to get, gather data that will prove this is a systemic decision by the Russian Federation to perpetrate these crimes with, uh, with regard to Ukraine and for this to find an ad hoc tribunal, ad hoc tribunal in a specific case that will uh, be able to try both Putin and the highest political leadership and the military leadership and eventually uh, hopefully will have uh, at the national Ukrainian level possibly with the involvement of international uh, attorneys and lawyers but primarily with the, with the ruling of the Ukrainian uh, courts will have cases on every citizen of Russia that uh, perpetrated uh, that perpetrated these crimes. Uh, can we look into a mechanism for this sort of trial? You've mentioned several possible uh, directions, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, cr the crime of aggression. We're talking about different kinds of uh, trial. Are these different kinds of trials or is this a single trial? The International Criminal Court that uh, has been working with the largest team in its history on the territory of Ukraine. They have an international attorney's office and uh, uh, international prosecutor. And this international prosecution prosecution office, we're 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 trying to bring back we're trying to bring back our connection. Is working in the territory of Ukraine. Has been working in Bucha. Of course, now cases like Olenivka and cases like the Izum, uh, the mass burial sites in Izum, will also now draw their attention. They cover war crimes. They cover crimes against humanity and the crime of genocide. Unfortunately, their jurisdiction does not uh, cover the crime of aggression. This decision to start the war, the occupation of Donbas and Crimea. So, which is why it's so important to have a separate tribunal that will respond to this. Unfortunately, there aren't other international structures. Why must the structure be international? Why has why cannot Ukraine individually decide that Putin is guilty, or that the the Duma or, or whatever the entire Russian government are guilty? It's very important to understand that all of the um, uh, all of the people elected by a country are provide pr are protected by its sovereignty, and so they have immunity in internationally. This immunity can only be overcome by an international uh, uh, initiative. So we need the acceptance, the support of this sort of tribunal by an international organization, perhaps the Euro 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 European Council, perhaps the OSCE, perhaps the UN General Assembly. Uh, 
the difficulty is the difficulty is that our uh, employees are now uh, in New York, where they're talking about this. The, U the Ukrainian official delegation is working this, both in Geneva and in New York. And uh, three days ago, perhaps four days ago, there was a decision by the international coordinational political body of the, the, the council in the within the Council of Europe, the Committee of Foreign Ministers of the countries of the Council of Europe, that supported the creation of this sort of mechanism of international international uh, jurisdiction. Sorry, sorry, I just want to clarify, just that we understand what we're talking about. So you. Uh, suggest to create an ad hoc separate mechanism uh, and to include both the war crimes, to cover both the war crimes, the war uh, crimes against humanity and the crime of aggression, so that it's all seen as part of the same trial. Well, we need a tribunal on, we need a tribunal on the crime of aggression, first of all, big because that's not covered by anything else. At the same time, the crime of aggression is the largest crime, and it's a complex crime, because all of the war crimes, uh, the crime against humanity, crimes of genocide that are now being documented by the International Criminal Court and covered by the International Criminal Court, they will be subsumed by this crime of aggression. And the most important thing is that we have to look not just at the, at the tip, at the top, at, the, at, the, at, the, at Putin and the, and the leadership, who are supposed to be responsible for these orders to fire at civilians, but specifically the civilians and the personnel of the Russian army who executed these, these orders. So, so I think this is an important... Go so you see this as different uh, processes, the tribunal on aggression and the tribunal that covers all different uh, other crimes. Or will this be one process? No, this will be one trial. One trial. Okay. The reason I ask this is, as you know, the office of the president have presented their vision where they propose to separate the crime of aggression and now move with the faster uh, formation of an international tribunal with this particular uh, episode. Uh, do you coordinate in any way with the Ukrainian government, your actions? Uh, there is no contradiction. Again, the model will be formed. The most difficult thing really is to create this tribunal because, you know, there was the difficulty, for instance, the there was a tribunal on MH17. There was the idea to form the tribunal on MH17. It wasn't just Ukraine. There were also European countries involved, uh, countries like and also like countries like Australia, Mal Malaysia, the Netherlands. Nevertheless, the Russian Federation blocked this decision in the Security Council. So there's there's not really a conflict. There's not really a contradiction. Uh, in any case, we need a tribunal on the aggression, and on the other hand, there is already a trial on the war crime. So, 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 but, but then, do you do you coordinate your actions with the, with the Ukrainian government? Of course, we're discussing this, but advocates do not. Uh, we do not uh, perform uh, decisions of the government. We do uh, expert assessments, and we su suggest what we see as necessary for the Ukrainian society. So these are parallel initiatives. Then, uh, yes, yes, and when. When our stances and our positions completely coincide in terms of aggression, of course we support the stance, but our vision might be different, yes. Understood. Um, in terms of what we're talking about, um, we're shocked by what we've seen in Izum and in the liberated territories. To what extent does this add argumentation, add ammunition to, to you and to uh, your, uh, your colleagues in this initiative? Okay. Unfortunately, we uh, this was expected. Of course, we hoped that maybe at least the scale uh, after Bucha was uh, known and Irpin and I mean Bucha was just the loudest, but really proportionally and every every village of the Chernihiv, Kiev, Kharkiv, Sumy region that were liberated uh, proportionally, we had the same sort of numbers uh, of uh, people who have been tortured and we killed. Bucha was just the largest. Uh, the place that was occupied the longest. What we see in the Zoom now is simply a continuation, an extension of what happened. The same things are happening in the small liberated places in Kherson region, Kharkiv region, Luhansk region. We see that the policy of the Russian Federation in terms of uh, how they wage war with through war crimes has not changed. And does it help us, yes, because all of these crimes, all these international crimes that we're talking about have to be proven as systemic, as this is policy. This isn't an excess by one soldier or by one detachment that have decided to do this. No, 
this is uh, completely guided, administered, repeatable uh, practice. It is clear, has motivation. For instance, for genocide, to, to recognize legally, to re classify uh, a, a genocide uh, against Ukrainians or people who speak Ukrainian or people who wear a br bracelet with Ukrainian symbols, we will have to prove that there was motivation to destroy these people. So, on the one hand, it's terrifying, and it has to be—it has to show people quite clearly that there is no, there is no such thing as quiet occupation. That there's no such thing when the Russians came in and nothing changed for us. Which is why the entire Ukrainian community they, uh, uh, resist resist uh, Russians in any form. Which is why this is dangerous because because it's dangerous to our life. So the investigation will be long because you understand that the uh, coroners work with bodies that have been uh, that have been buried for a while and not been buried properly so we have to know how these people how a person died because sometimes there are sanitary burials you know somebody dies over these 5 months but we have to clearly see uh, do we see uh, violence do we see broken bones do we see uh, traces of torture uh, was this or was this bringing someone to 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 to, to death where people were uh, refused uh, food and water or medications this 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 is a war crime too and all of this needs to be proven criminalistically because we're talking about justice proper justice not what russia is, practices on their territory when you are asked by international uh, interlocutors why the case of Ukraine is special? Why is it special? Why does it need a special separate ad hoc mechanism? How is it different from other uh, war uh, military conflicts? What do you say? How do you explain? Why Ukraine? Why specifically with Ukrainian, with the Russian aggression? Why do we specifically need this unique mechanism? Because we are living witnesses from a highly technological society which can prove all of this very quickly. We have 19 and a half documented, thousand of documented instances. We are not the police, you know, we are advocates. The attorneys, uh, the prosecutor's office has close to 20,000 cases registered in their system that are potentially war crimes. This is unique. This is unprecedented. This has never happened before because most of the war uh, confl con military conflicts, hostilities that are happening on Earth are happening in a space where either people are not sufficiently educated to, to document quick things fast or they don't have the tech, tech technology. They don't have smartphones or the internet. Here, every third person has such a thing. A very important aspect is that we can become a turning point for the entire uh, international uh, jurisdiction and uh, for the entire si international system of justice because it's no longer a problem where we oh, we couldn't document or prove it quickly. The, the, the evidence is right there. And the, the sooner you help us with the for criminalistically to analyze and, 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 and um, f fix uh, testimony, we'll have even more details. But even now we have this unique situation where a huge number of episodes, uh, and 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 I imagine we we, will, we we might be looking at possibly up to a hundred thousand episodes if we question all of the people who have witnessed such crimes. So a very important aspect is to to test any system of justice, even however however uniquely developed. However, you know, even if we look at a place like Britain or France or the United States, this would be a challenge. So here. You know, the international community either gets involved and we do this all together in order to prove that, yes, justice for every victim is a value for, mo for the modern democratic world, or otherwise, what are we talking about? I mean, this is, this is a, Ukraine is a massive uh, test, is a massive exam for international uh, legal culture in general, and this test can be past because Ukrainians are involved. We have 25 different initiatives, documenting initiatives, because all of the journalists even want to do uh, materials such that they are later accepted as evidence, can be later accepted as evidence. The world has a chance, and this is what we say, that we're not asking you, oh, we're victims, please help us. We're saying that we're partners. We're prepared to fight for this. Stand, get behind us. Uh, Thank you very much, Alexandra Romansova, Executive Director of the Center for Civil Liberties. Thank you for this conversation. And our next
press conference will be at 12.30. We'll be talking to Alexander Mareshko, head of the Parliamentary Committee for uh, International Policies.